Well, hello there. Welcome to another exciting interview on the Paranormal Highway. Today, we're going to be inter interviewing Jeff Harding of Pine Island Research. This is his Bigfoot encounter. Now, for the record, I just want to tell everybody here, I'm not here to try to convince you guys that Bigfoot's real. That's your call. That's up to you. What we're here to do is hear Jeff's story on his encounter. You know, how to affect his life. You know, where is he at? from the moment he had the encounter and where he's at today. That's what we're here for. You know, because most people in this world, be honest with you, don't believe in something unless it happens to them. Unless it happens to them, they don't believe it. Now, when you listen to the story, if you're a skeptic, if you're a skeptic, just ask yourself, but what if, what if, there is a Bigfoot. I know he's real. I have an encounter. Not like Jeff's encounter, but what you're about to learn. But what if? And what if you're in that same situation? You know, his story might give you clues on something that you might accidentally fall into. So if you're a skeptic, leave it to the side. Just tell yourself, well, what if it's real? You know? And if you believe that Jeff's story is a grizzly bear of all things. Well, he still had an encounter with something that scared the crap out of him. And that's something that you should all listen to and try to figure out what happened. Just in case you're in that spot. Because like I said, I'm not here to tell you the Bigfoot's real. I know he's real. So what I'm going to do is, if this is your first time here, I'm going to bring Jeff up by himself. He will tell his story. We will not interrupt him. And once he's finished, myself and Anthony are going to ask him questions based on the story he just told us. So kick back, grab some coffee, grab soda, steaks, or whatever you want. Get ready because I feel that this is probably going to be an, not, not, not an amazing story, an emotional type of story. So... That's it. Let's get this party started. Thanks, Eric. My name is Jeff Harding with Pine Island Research. Uh, I'm a 54-year-old uh, dad who owns a real estate firm. Um, was in the military for a while. I served in the 29th Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne. But um, the my encounter happened when I was 18 years old. I grew up the son of a hunting and fishing guide. I'd been, since I was really young, 13, 14, I can remember hunting black bears for the first time, uh, being in Montana, Wyoming, northern Minnesota, upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, and in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And the I didn't grow up in a family where I had uncles, sitting around a campfire telling about Bigfoot encounters and stuff like that. I'd I had no reference to what Sasquatch is or what, what an experience would be like because I never grew up around. I didn't know anybody who'd ever had anything like that. I remember being eight years old at a Saturday afternoon matinee at a movie and seeing the Patterson-Gimlin film played before the movie started. And I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. But that was really it. So 18 years old, graduated from high school. I had about six weeks before I left for my military basic training. Um, a friend of mine whose dad was also uh, involved in the hunting and fishing industry said that him and his family, him and his dad, his little brother, and several of his uncles and cousins, there was 10 of or nine of them total, I would be number 10. We're gonna take a couple of vehicles and drive up to Northern Manitoba, about 120 miles uh, northeast of, of Flin Flon, which is on the Saskatchewan Manitoba border, to go to the Churchill River system on Granville Lake and fish in a very remote area and I asked if I wanted to come with. This was the week following us graduating and I th kind of threw the idea at my parents and my parents felt like, you know, look, you leave for the army in, in six weeks, why not? I mean, you got to fit a whole summer into a few weeks. And so I took them up on it and 
we drove 30 some hours to get up there um, in three different vehicles. We were bringing our own uh, 14 and 16 foot aluminum boats that were stacked up in a horse trailer with 20 horse outboards, 25 horse outboards. Um, the way that I guess they chose this location is my friend's dad had, uh, there's three Inuit brothers that run this really remote area that live on this lake. They're the only ones who lived on the lake. And um, they invited my friend's dad to come up with his family members and, and join them. Um, so we went up there. Normally they don't have people there fishing. They're really more hunting guides. Uh, they guide moose hunters up there. So when we got there, it was pretty crazy. The last couple hours, it took a couple hours to drive that last 15 miles in there because it was just a fire trail to get into this place. Um, it was a very large lake, a lot of different islands. And we would go out, um, me and my best friend, who was also 18, his little brother had just turned 14. And the three of us kind of hung out together because everybody else, even his cousins, as well as his uncles and whatnot, were all in their 20s and up. His uncles were in their 50s. His dad was up in his upper 40s. Um, and so me and my friend and his little brother were always in a boat together. The day one we went out, um, this was before GPS. This is the first week in June in 1987. And we had a little laminated map that showed the lake and the depths and the different islands. Some of the islands were big and had names. Some of them were small islands, didn't have a name. And it would be really easy to get behind an island and not have a visual of where that shoreline where your camp is because there are no cabins there. There's no power lines. Every bit of shoreline is solid timber. Um, so it's very disorienting. You get behind an island and without GPS, since they didn't have that, then you might be really lost. So we started out the first day and even the second day not going very far away from the two docks that were at this remote area. And we were staying in like, you know, basically framed tents is what it was. There was no running water, things like that. Um, each day on the first day, I can remember when we were out there seeing a moose swimming across the lake, like to an island. Um, we, we would see moose, deer, and bear often swimming in the lake. It was just crazy. It, it all it made me kind of wonder what makes a, a big game animal stand on a shoreline and say, ooh, I'm going to swim all the way over there. I mean, but it was pretty amazing to see it. A lot of times we'd pull our boats up by it, our boat up by it and see them. But we would go out and fish. <clears throat> and it was really good fishing. It wasn't hard to catch fish there. And we'd catch some northern pike and walleyes, and we'd come back to the dock every day in the mid-afternoon. We'd leave early in the morning, come back around 1, 2 o'clock, and um, everybody would kind of come back to camp in their boats. There was We had three boats total with all, or four boats total with, with the people in our party. You never saw another boat on this lake other than just ours. It was a large lake, but there's just, it's undeveloped. It's very, very remote. Um, and I remember the first day coming back to the lake, we were excited about catching fish, you know, and we were showing, we were holding them up like we're the heroes, and they were all laughing because we didn't realize it, but everybody had caught fish that day, and everybody caught fish every day. But we'd have lunch with them in the mid afternoon and then usually around four in the afternoon, everybody'd go back out for a few hours again before dark. And this, this is kind of the MO for day one, day two, day three on day four, we woke up and there was about an inch of sl sloppy snow on the ground. And this is the first week in Jimmy. Mean, it was really cold. Um, when we got in the boat and left that day to go out and fish, 
It was in the mid 30s. That snow was melting. And by mid morning, I mean, it was already up into the 50s. Um, my friend's little brother had to take a leak. And he's the type of guy who can't pee out of a boat. And so th by that day, it was, the, like I say, the fourth day, we were kind of venturing out a little bit further than we had the first day or two. So we were, we'd gone like eight miles up the lake away from where our camp was, past several islands. And uh, when he had to go pee, we looked at a shoreline on a little island that when I looked at the map, this island didn't have a name. <clears throat> the, the island next to it was called Patton Island. So we pulled up on the shoreline, and it was like a gravel 20-foot wide or so shoreline to the tree edge that kind of stretched around that whole half of that island. And the island itself was only about maybe 25, 30 acres in size, but it had a lot of undulation. The, you could see that the middle of the island sat like 30 feet above the water. So I would imagine it's probably like a rock outcropping that over time, you, dirt and trees and everything started growing. It had, you know, 60 to 80 foot tall pines and poplars and birch growing on it. Um, when we got on the shoreline, we just kind of pulled the boat up a little bit onto the gravel and my friend uh, and his little brother were taking a leak and I didn't have to go. So I walked down the shoreline and saw a game trail that went up into these thick woods, about a 30 degree slope up. It was pretty steep. But it, what was really interesting to me is I'd seen tons of game trails growing up hunting with my dad, but it, this one was like three and a half, four foot wide. It was really wide. Um, since it had snowed the night before, this thing was pine needles laying over the top of like a, a greasy surface. I mean, it. I had sweatpants and a hoodie, a t-shirt and a hoodie on with Converse high tops. I wasn't really wearing hiking boots. We didn't plan on going hiking that day. But as I started walking up this trail, you'd take three or four steps and slide back a step or two. I mean, it was hard to get your footing. But I kept going up it, and I yelled over to him and said, I'm going to check out this game trail. And as I started moving on, I could hear this huge tree break. I mean, it was just a kaboom. It's not like very large snapping sound and there was no wind I mean the water was like glass that morning but because the air was so moist I mean everything just like almost had this ambient echo to it so when so you hear something like that it was like it probably seemed like it was closer than it was but this is a small island I mean it couldn't be that far away and I heard that and I, I could tell it was to my left and I was trying to guess that this must be 40 or 50 yards away that this thing was because that's how loud it was. And I stood there on the trail and I was pretty sure that I was going to see a black bear. And when, when I went through my head on what would be able to do something like that, uh, break something that and make it that loud. It, it seemed to me like the most likely snow would be a black bear either rubbing against a birch tree, which have pretty shallow roots. Um, they can snap them over pretty easy. Or maybe it was stepping on deadfall and had enough weight to break it. Just didn't seem likely that a moose would do that or a deer that this was likely or there was a black bear. And because it's the first week in June, I knew that if it was a sow black bear, there's a good chance it was going to have a cub or have a set of cubs. And I knew that it was fairly close, so I didn't want to run you know, or, or try to hightail it down that trail. I was quite a ways up this trail by the time this happened. And so I was reluctant because I didn't want to trigger like a pursuit response or pursuit mode in something like a sow black bear with cubs you know I felt comfortable enough that if I stand there and watch this timber and watch all this deadfall which it was a lot going on when you're trying to visually find something there's little cedar scrubs and all that there 
I just stood there watching intently thinking, I'm going to see a black bear move. And, it, and once I could tell that it was 40 or 50 yards away, then I'd feel comfortable slowly going down that trail. But I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't standing 10 feet away from something. You're 15 feet away from something before I try to take off. And um, I wasn't seeing anything. And it was baffling to me. I wasn't hearing anything. I could hear my friends talking down on the beach and actually yelling up saying, Hey, what was that? What was that? You know? And I didn't want to yell back at them because like I say, I don't know where the, this bear is, but, um, I stood there for quite a while. I mean, it was over two minutes, um, probably out between two and three minutes. And I did not see, any black movement or any dark movement in this deadfall or in the trees. And I was looking down the trail because I thought, I wonder if they're going to come up here. I thought maybe my friend and his brother were going to come up the trail eventually because I'd been up there for a little while. And when I turned around and looked up the trail, I turned around and 15 feet away from me, I'm looking at two thighs that kind of had the shape of human legs, thighs, that looked like two five-gallon buckets next to each other. I mean, that's the diameter they had, covered in dark hair. Um, and immediately, my brain starts going into this check-down mode of what this isn't. I knew it wasn't a brown bear. I knew it wasn't a black bear. I knew it wasn't a moose. I knew doesn't appear to be human it's way too big to be human um the, the the dimensional even though the legs appear human the just dimensionally it's just no way it could be human um and i was stuck i mean my mind in that in that probably one and a half seconds of trying to analyze that i was my my head's glitching at that point and like i say i'm 18 years old with no reference of what you know that would be i mean at, right now at 54 years old knowing what i know it's likely i would have turned around seeing that and thought oh my gosh is that sasquatch but at that age i didn't have that reference you know and so as i look at its thighs i looked up at towards its waist and you need to understand this is a 30 degree incline uphill so this thing even though it's only about 15 feet in front of me it's probably standing two to three feet above higher on higher ground than i am so that's why my eyes were looking at it like at its thighs but as i look up and i see its its hips and and i seen its hands like this at its waist cradling a birch log about six seven inches round a, a birch log and you can you can see that light colored uh bark all along it it's about six foot long in length and on one side of it there was a root ball about the size of uh not quite as big as a five gallon but like a three gallon bucket size root ball on one side and it just seemed really odd to me that this thing's holding something and because at that point my mind's thinking this has got to be a human because you can see its fingers and its fingertips and its nails. I mean, it they even though they had hair on the back of them, they're shaped like a like a really big human hand. And as I'm looking up its body, it's there's no hourglass to it. It was barrel chested, and the width of the shoulders, the body mass on this thing was hard for me to to try to analyze what this is truly a, a shock moment that my mind is not working to try to analyze what I'm looking at. And um, because of its height, I, I, we, you'll, I'll share this later in the story of how we kind of came arrived at this, but um, I thought that it was between nine and a half, 10 foot tall. Because, you know, like if you're standing underneath of a basketball hoop and looking straight up at the rim, 
that's what it was like for me to look up at its shoulders, even though it was three foot taller than me. I mean, I'm looking up, up, up at this thing. And when I saw its face, I could see a jawline that looked human. It was covered in hair. Its bottom lip was hanging open, kind of. What I would compare that to is if you've ever seen a bear try to wind you, and I've had this happen archery hunting at that point when I was younger, a lot of times they'll sag their lip out as if they're trying to waft air up to their nose to, to smell you. And it, that's kind of how it's the lower half of its jaw looked. It looked like it was lazily lip was kind of hanging forward. You could see those bottom teeth easily. The skin looked like uh, dry dirt. It didn't have a sheen to it. It wasn't glossy. It, its cheeks and nose and around its top of its lip and its eyes where you could see the skin looked like it was matte black, like dried dirt. And it was there was cracks in it. Um, the hair wasn't short. I've seen a lot of different depictions now of, of people explaining what they saw to different artists and they get drawn. And I've seen now where a lot of people, this short hair depictions and things like this. This thing had hair that kind of framed down its face the way that the the what I what I guess would I would call bangs kind of hung down to like here and longer hair hanging down all over its chest and shoulders. Um as soon as I was trying to look up high enough to really see its eyes this birch log that was holding when i say that it threw it um i want you to understand it didn't it didn't like chuck it like this it, it just basically looked like it was no effort it was like just shucked it forward like that but the force that it hit me in my waist and thighs this log hit me and knocked me completely off my feet and I landed on my back and was sliding down. And as I'm looking up at this thing, as I'm sliding backwards, I could see it physically jump up and down twice. I mean, it went boom, boom with both of its feet. And it, as I'm sliding down this wet, greasy game trail backwards, I could feel that reverberation to the ground. Like if I walked up behind you and thumped you on your back i could feel that i mean just the weight and the resonance of it um but i you know this trail had so much overhang from the trees that were around and things the poplar trees and the and the um the, the birch trees that hung over the edges of it that you know we, even when you got low and looked up it at that at that the steepness of it you'd only see 15 or 20 feet and you'd have to walk 10 or 15 feet to see another 20 feet i mean it was you couldn't see way up this trail and so as i'm sliding away from it i i kind of lose sight but i've got this birch log literally it, it's twisted now and it's in line with my body as i'm sliding down this hill on my back and I didn't realize it till I had gotten close to the bottom of it. I was near the beach. I jumped up on my feet, realized that my one of my ankles was twisted pretty pretty badly. And I get out onto the beach and I'm yelling at my friends, get in the effing boat. I mean, I am screaming at them, get in the effing boat. And they're looking at me all pie-eyed like they thought, uh, in retrospect, we had a conversation about this and they told me that they thought that I was attacked by a bear because I was covered in mud on my back. I had uh, was limping and they just thought that I got injured by an animal. And so as I'm screaming, get in the boat, they're moving. I mean, my buddy's little brother flew into the back of this boat and started trying to start that motor. And my friend was standing at the front of the boat, pushing it off of the beach. 
And as I'm trying to get to the boat, I can't keep my eye, I can't stop myself from looking at this game show. I mean, it felt like this thing was behind me, like right behind me. And as I kind of sidestep towards the boat, I get to the boat. I'm running kind of sideways because I can't turn my back to the skein trail, but yet my foot was injured enough that I couldn't just take off sprinting either. And I waded out about two foot deep where I'm standing next to the boat, and I just kind of flung my body over the gunwale of the boat and got in it and sat in that center seat. And my buddy's sitting there trying to start the boat, or my buddy's brother is trying to start the boat. And that, again, in retrospect, my friend who's 18, like me, is, has ran a boat, an outboard motor like that a lot. I mean, we duck on it an awful lot together. I don't know if his little brother's ever started an outboard motor before. He just turned 14. And my friend's yelling at him, you know, turn the choke off, make sure the ball's pumped up, all this stuff. And I'm thinking that this thing's going to step out on the beach. I mean, I'm kind of oblivious to the fact that my friend's little brother can't get this boat started. I'm just fixated on this tree line going, this thing's going to come out onto this beach. We have to get off of this beach. And I'm yelling at Paul, at my buddy. I said, just get in the boat, get in the boat. And he hoists himself up over the front tip of the boat and jumps in, passes me on the center seat and yells at his little brother says, get in the front of the boat. And they swap positions. And Paul's sitting there trying to get this motor started. And while he's doing that, his little brother's sitting in the front seat, and his little brother's coming undone. I mean, the I was in shock I, because I couldn't make sense at what had just happened. It was absolutely real. What I saw was real. There's no doubt that this thing is there. But trying to analyze what it is and, and explain in my head what what it what it is, it just I was glitching on that. And at that time, we saw I happened to quick look down the beach because I saw dark movement. I seen this black bear run out of the tree line onto the beach, about 70, 80 yards down the beach. And I'm thinking, well, whatever this thing was, must have scared this black bear too. Because it, and this black bear looked up the beach and saw our boat and started walking towards us up the beach. And my buddy's little brother is screaming, "Oh my gosh! You know, there's a bear coming! There's a bear coming!" And um, anyways, this bear gets up close to our boat. It's missing one of its paws. I don't know if it lost it to a boar when it was little or if it got caught in a trap and chewed it or what, what happened, but it was missing a paw. My buddy's little brother grabbed a northern pike off of a stringer that we had caught and threw it up on the shore, and this thing picks this fish up and just in one bite chomps the head off of it. And it's standing there staring at us eating this fish. It's not a big black bear. It's only like a two-year-old bear. It's barely 300 pounds, you know. And... um while it's standing there doing this, my buddy finally gets this motor started and starts backing away from the shoreline. And as, it, as we are, this bear snaps his head and looks at the tree line, drops that fish, and takes off running the direction it came from, like, full blast. You haven't seen a bear run this fast before. It's like a car. I mean, it's like 30, it felt like it was 30, 30, 35 mile an hour. This thing was just hauling ass down the shore. And I'm just looking at this tree line going, holy smokes, this thing's going to come out. And as we're backing away, we kept backing away further and further and further pretty quickly. And we get about 70, 80 yards away from the shoreline. And there it is. This thing walks right out of the tree line, walks straight up to the water's edge, stops about three or four feet short of the water's edge. And that's when my buddy's screaming at me, what the F is that? What is going on here? What is that? And his little brother turns on sees it, and he just loses it. I mean, he just comes undone. He's emotionally broken right now in this whole position of duress that we're in. But like I say, I mean, I'm more consumed by the shock of it, whereas he was just physically coming undone. And in retrospect with that, I, I have two boys, one's 17, one's 18 years old. They're young men. 
and how they would react to something like this is a lot different how than how they would have four years ago when they were my friend's little brother's age. I mean, it you're a little a little more fragile probably when it comes to those type of PTSD type situations. But he was crying, he was screaming, he was freaking out. And I'm watching this thing on the beach, and like I say, we're 70, 80 yards away, and it very fluidly just leans over with one hand, picks that fish up, and holds it in front of its body, this fish with no head on it. And he's looking at our boat, watching us for about 15 seconds, and it just turns around and walks right back into the tree line. And we had backed out and talked to, I mean, me and my friend and his little brother were like, what the hell was that? And I kept telling them, that thing had to be 10 foot tall, right? I mean, I that thing was standing 15 feet in front of me. And that was when I had the opportunity to really share with them what had happened to me on this game trail. I said, that thing was 15 feet in front of me. And that thing had to be 10 foot tall, right? And Paul... My buddy said, I'm going to tell you right now, if you ran as fast as you could and jumped as high as you could, I don't know if you could touch its head. And so it has to be like basketball rim height to the top of its head. It just looked that tall. Now, I'm not going to say we aren't a foot off and it was nine foot tall or whatever, but it looked between nine and a half and ten foot tall. But anyways, I've shared this encounter in different areas online. There's uh, quite a few different places I've shared it. You can see it on my YouTube channel, Pine Island Research. And I'm releasing a book here in three weeks uh, called The Pine Island Incident. It's coming out on Hangar One Publishing. Um, that talks about the encounter in depth, in detail, way more than what I've shared here. Uh, it gets into where we go back to the camp and I talk to the, one of these Inuit guides, the oldest of these three brothers, and I decided to share with him what had happened to me. My friend and his brother decided they weren't going to tell their dad because they didn't feel anybody would believe us and that all these people being older than us on this trip, that they we'd just be the laughing stock. We'd have to be there four more days with them and nobody would believe us. And so they didn't want to tell anybody. I told this guide about it, and what he shared with me blew me away. And I cover that in the book. But in a, in a, in a nutshell, that's that's my encounter. There's a, I wrote a lot of stuff here, but I'm going to start from the beginning. One of the things that I, I'm learning is that you're 18 years old, and it was the fourth day on this trip. You guys were in the boat. I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna ask this real quick. Why you guys on the boat? Were you guys drinking alcohol, any kind of stuff that no. maybe? No, okay. I just want to. We that were out. pretty straight shooters. Um, straight shooters. Okay. My my friend was an A student and was looking at a career, you know, full ride to college. Me, I was going in the military. I couldn't, you can't even get okay. into the military if you can't pass a drug test. Well, you know, you know people, Jeff. People might think, sure, oh, they're sure. I, I, hey, I'm not going to tell you. In my years in high school, if there was a kegger going on, I was probably there, right? But yeah. the, on this trip, no kegger on the boat. <laughs> on this trip, because we were with his dad and his relatives, I mean, there just wasn't. An atmosphere for us to do and, that. And one of the interesting thing is, is it was on a day that was, it was about 30, 30 degrees weather. It was cold. By it, the time this incident happened, it was probably pushing 55, 60 degrees on. But the snow was melting. And what I mean by yeah. that is, is when snow is melting, not a whole lot of people are going to be out. Less people until the weather's warmer and stuff. So there's going to be less people during these trips. Yeah. Now, and, and where we were, I want to really uh, understand, have people understand a lot of people's idea of remote to me is simply just rural, right? Like if you sprained an ankle and you could walk five miles, you're going to find a road. There's going to be people driving around. That's not where this was. This You could go 20 miles in one direction and not find a road. There's no humans there. There's no development on this lake. We it is nowhere. truly off grid. Yeah. And that's what I want to say. You know, this is a an area that Bigfoot don't expect a lot of traffic in the first place. No, I you know, would, so this is a place where he can roam 
a lot easier. In retrospect, I've often wondered that, Eric, is as baffled as I was looking at what I was looking at, I kind of wonder if he was too. If he, if he was looking at me and going, what the heck is going on? What is this? Because that's how remote this area was. You know, you hear about Bigfoot encounters down south. It's likely these specimens have seen hundreds of people in their life. Maybe this one's never even seen a human before. I don't know. I bet you that's what saved you from maybe even being attacked by the thing. He was so confused as to what he was looking at. He was curious. You know? Well, in the years since this encounter, my research has really led me to believe that their number one want is for humans to leave where they are. So, you know, they're going to use a tiered system. They're going to bang on a tree. They're going to break a branch. Try to do something to make there's, you just feel uncomfortable. And there's leave. my first question. There's my first question because you got lucky in a way because your friends also heard the banging sound. You know what I mean? I mean, you have yeah. backup on that. Yeah. When you heard. The, uh, the, the sound on the tree, was there a pattern to it by any chance or was it just like one hit? Two it hits? was just one boom. And I think what it was is because there was a root ball on this stump that it's holding, my guess is that um, it was a tree that maybe had recently fallen over. You know, birch trees are very shallow rooted. And when they're growing on an area like this, where there's likely you dig down a foot and you hit rock, right? Because this island is the way it is, that it doesn't take much wind to blow over a birch tree or a bear could scratch us back and knock over a pretty good sized birch tree pretty easily. So my guess is this was a down tree. And what it did was it stomped on that tree at like six foot from the ripple and actually broke it. So that it could pick okay. up a piece of it rather than having a 30 foot tall. So tree you don't think it was like a warning hit? Like you hear this? Get the hell off my property. Oh, my. I think I think it's stopping it. It was trying to make noise as it, you know, first of all, if it's on that island at that elevation and it heard it could easily hear our boat coming. It saw us coming to the okay. island. And then we're on the island and two of us are peeing on the shoreline. And then one of us walks up this trail. I'm thinking that as soon as I started coming up that trail, it stopped that thing in an attempt to say, leave, you know. This might sound weird. But I'm wondering, when, when you guys are, are taking a leak, it can smell it. Like 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 you're peeing on my land. You know, he's, they smell you. He smells you. He, you know, he knows your presence there and all that. And one of the, one of the hardest things to do, Jeff, to ask you questions is you, you explain a lot of things. I was going to ask you, like, how do you know it's nine feet, ten feet tall? You said a basketball court. I mean, you made sure to say why you know it's this tall. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like a, a, they say like a lion is a king of the mouth. You know, this is my area. Because Bigfoot it hurt you. But he didn't kill you. He could have. He did could not. Could easily. You think he hurt you on purpose to say, get the hell out of here because this could be a lot worse. I, I believe that they likely use a tiered response when somebody is in an area that, and they want them to leave. They're going to start by making something audible like stomping or, or, or knocking on a tree or whatever. And if that's ignored and that person keeps coming into that area maybe at that point they do a vocalization and maybe it doesn't even sound like them maybe they're vocalizing trying to mimic a bobcat or something You're trying to make you feel like ooh, we got to get out of here right and then if you if that doesn't work maybe they eventually get to a point where i have to show myself to them and get to get them to leave and Quite honestly, when I turned around and saw it, I didn't turn around and take off. I was truly, in shock. I was standing there bewildered, like, what am I looking at here? So I spent several seconds standing there looking at it before it, before it kind of shucked what it was holding at me. And so I just think it starts with, I broke something, he didn't leave. Um, I, whatever, I, I showed myself he didn't leave. I had to shuck this thing at him and then finally they leave, you know, at any point he could have just hit. When I stood there for almost three minutes looking, wondering where this bear is that I thought was out there, he could have hit me in the head with the thing and yeah. killed me if he wanted me dead. He just wanted me to leave, I believe. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is, and I'll have Anthony ask you stuff, a 
for a bear to get scared and run off and leave his food that he just caught on the ground, that bear had to be so scared not to run off with his food in its mouth. It's almost like he heard the Bigfoot coming. He knows if he didn't drop his food for him, he could, because you, you said that the bear was missing a paw. So who, who knows? Maybe the Bigfoot is the reason why it was missing a paw. I mean, we don't know that. Why? He's yeah, I, when I look at that, I think the most plausible natural explanation of that, and it is fairly common, is that um, young bears, when they're born, boars don't like cubs. They want that sow to themselves. Now that sow's busy for a year, year and a half, raising two cubs. A lot of times when these these cubs are really quite small, these these boars, these big male bears will attack them. And it's possible that maybe it was got attacked or got its paw bitten so badly that it lost it. Or it could have at some point gotten caught in a trap, which is also fairly common with bears to where the way out of the trap is to your paw, you know. Is there, is there beer hunting out there, like beer hunting oh, seasons yeah. out there? Oh, okay, yeah. so there is. Okay. There's Anthony, trapping season, bear season, and whatnot. Anthony, ask away. So I, I'm just curious because I hear a lot of, I'm hearing more now, a lot of stories of people saying that they're having communication with Sasquatch. Did you encounter any like that? Do you, do you feel like, you know, the thing was trying to communicate with you in any way, shape, or form aside from, you know, throwing the log or knocking? I, I really back? don't. You know, I, I've i talked to one chapter in my book. I interviewed Leon Thompson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a really good at analyzing human behavior in PTSD situations, Things how, how humans respond to things like that. And it's possible that you know, when I say I never heard a vocalization, I never heard it make any vocal sound at all. Um, it's possible that maybe it did, but because my eyes were so overwhelmed with the visual that maybe I, I wasn't tuned into that. Or, right. you know, it's just something about human behavior that when your senses get alerted visually, audibly, whatever, I'm smelling something different. As soon as I smell something in the air and I'm like, what, what would that be? If you, if you found yourself in that situation, something audibly might happen that you don't realize. But yet, if you weren't busy trying to smell something and figure out what it was, you easily would have heard it. Right. It's just the preoccupation that comes over you with your senses, you know. But as far as I know, it never made any vocalization at all. And I know you were very overwhelmed by, by looking at this thing because you've never seen anything like that before. So it probably you were probably very frightened when you seen the, the mass size of this thing, but do you, th what do you think it was doing there? Do you think it's possible it was God and it's young, maybe a little further out? Or uh, in retrospect, I think it was alone. It wasn't a big enough Island to really habituate on. Also, <clears throat> it wasn't very far from the mainland. I mean, you, this thing's only like half mile to three quarters of a mile you could swim from the mainland of this island it wouldn't be hard to get there um i believe it was probably hunting on it and i i kind of have arrived at that through my last few years of research of trying to figure out you know why would these things be in certain areas what are the resources that bring them to different areas when somebody tells me i saw one here right away i don't think what did it look like i think why would it have been there? What resources are there that's looking? Is this a place that has a lot of berries? Is there a creek there? Is there, you know? So when I think back, I think if you if you were nine and a half foot tall and weighed about a thousand pounds, I don't care how fast you are. It's not easy to catch a deer. It's not. No. It's it's a difficult process, right? The the ambushing and waiting and getting yourself in the right position and the struggle. It, if it could get its hands on it and surprise it, it probably would be all in favor of the Sasquatch, right? Mm -hmm. But if it steps out and gives that deer a 10-foot head start, you've got to chase it. It'd be sure. hard for it to win, right? But if you were to put yourself on an island like that with elevation where you could see everything around you, you yeah. see those moose swimming around and deer. And if you, you might have to wait a day or two, 
But eventually you start seeing a deer or a moose swimming to the island you're on. You can go right down to that tree line where that thing's going to swim out. And when it comes onto okay. that shore, it's exhausted. You can just step out and break its neck. There'd be yeah. no struggle at all. Sure. So I kind of wonder if it wasn't using that island as, as a resource to hunt from, not necessarily raise a family on, because it just wasn't that big of an island. I'm going to uh, ask you one last question, and I'll give my final thoughts. What you know now, if you never had that incident, I know it's the hardest question to ask. What you know now, and you say you studied Bigfoot without having an incident, and you go, you went there, just say you went, you go there tomorrow. Do you think what you learn, if you're in that same exact position tomorrow, you would have reacted different or you would have done something differently by any chance? I think the fact that I had no reference, that I had heard no stories, I had no visual of what one of these things would look like. You know, I hadn't heard people tell stories about them. I think my ignorance of it actually worked out in my favor in that situation. I think the fact that I was in shock, that I didn't audibly shriek or freak out, that I was just actually standing there bewildered was probably in that moment the best thing I could do to not really get injured. I, I, I right now at 54, being you know doing some research for a few years and kind of learning the things I've learned from other people's encounters and educating myself, I, I'm a little worried at about what my reaction now, if I was in that position, would be. Would it have triggered a different response and possibly one that wasn't as good? You know, that didn't work out in my favor. So, and I, I just want to say, uh, I want to thank you, Jeff, for coming on this uh, show today, uh, telling us your story. I think for a lot of people who might have heard this kind of story for the first time, you know, I don't know if it's going to help them or not, but I hope that people take something about this that listen you go out in an area you might want to go with some friends and stuff but you know not by yourself you know you're luckily you had a boat you have people to get it started to you know to get out of there as soon as possible because if it's just you in that boat in the state that you're in you might not have uh started in time and got out you might have been attacked yeah, by the black right. bear <laughs> also along with the bigfoot that you saw so. had, had my had that sprained ankle been any worse than it was if that would have been a broken shin bone or something it, it, i might not have been able to physically get myself to the boat well, well, quick, Jeff, i'm just curious due to the sheer size of the animal I'm, I'm assuming you're speculating it was male i believe it probably was yeah i mean i didn't see anything like the pendulous breasts of the pg film you know yeah it, yeah, yeah. But, well well, I'm going to give my final thoughts, and I'll talk to you guys behind the scenes. His story is amazing because you guys know, you know, my story is I got lucky. I had a family that talked about Bigfoot. So we knew Bigfoot. In, in, in my defense, we thought Bigfoot was completely real before we, we even saw Bigfoot. We treated Bigfoot like the Santa Claus story until one day at school. You know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have internet. Well, we, most people didn't even believe in Bigfoot. It was a shock to us. Like, really? It was talked to us like it, like, like it was nothing. And when we saw Bigfoot, we're stupid enough and ran after it. His story, his family never talked about Bigfoot. So he, he never even knew about cryptids. So his approach was way different. And he made a good point. What if we were at his spot saw this Bigfoot that he saw and we try to chase it. You know, this is a different Bigfoot, different state. We might not have a, an outcome where we are talking about today like, wow, what an experience. We could have talked about something worse. Something that's deadlier. And thank God nobody got hurt. But technically he got hurt. To me, I feel like this Bigfoot is was basically saying, this is my area. I'm going to put a little hurt on you just so you know that I can hurt you. I can put you in the ground and nobody will ever see you. It was, it was like he used Jeff to warn other people that, hey, this, that's his country. That's his land. But, you know, the best thing about Jeff is he, he took an experience now. 
he's got a channel, Pine Island Research. And I'll, I'll have all the links in the description. He started another channel. I have all the links in the description that now he made a safe zone where if you have a story, you can go to his channel. You can tell him. And he's got an understanding of what people's gone through. And that helps. And it's like, it's like, like he said, you know, people can develop PTSD. And the best, I'm not a doctor, but one of the cure for PTSD, just to be able to talk about it. And he made a safe zone channel where you could go to his channel in a safe zone, be surrounded by people who might have are interested in it, might have some experience with it, and you could feel safe by talking about your experience. Because when you hold an experience for so long in your life, you're never able to tell people about it. Like he said, when they got away from there, you know, they couldn't even tell their parents, tell you know other people, you know, and that eats you up on the inside. And now we're luckily that we live in a world where there is more social media. There are communities that will listen to you. Yeah, there's trolls. We can't, you know, we can't control them. But there are channels like Jeff now that is there for one reason. To share. To share information. Not about fame. It's not about making money. It's about sharing their experiences. And hopefully in the long run, that helps you for yourself to feel relieved and hopefully live a better life yourself. You know, so all I'm going to say is, guys, even even you skeptics, I know a lot of you skeptics don't believe something until it happens to you. We know that. But you never know if you're going to be in a position where you were like him. And hopefully you can hear his story and it, it'd be enough for you to get out of there because that's all we want. We want everybody to be safe. So I hope you guys enjoyed this today and I want to see everybody on the Paranormal Highway. Oh.